Anybody glad to be in church today? Make some noise if you are glad to be here. Awesome. Hey, what a great Sunday it is. And uh, Pastor Ben, we are in week number three of a series that we've been doing here called Ask Away. And this series has been developed by the content from individuals at both of our campuses submitting questions anonymously uh, at askawayseries.com website, and then we've been trying to tackle as many questions as we can uh, throughout these few weeks, and today we'll, we'll continue to do that. So before we jump into the conversation this morning, let me take the opportunity, look at the cameras in the back of this room, say a great big hello to our extended family, yes. our Go Church family. Come on, can you welcome them? Oh, Go yeah. Church, we love you. We're so proud of what God is doing there at our campus, uh, 25 miles outside of the nation's capital. We love you so much, and may God be with you today as you are joining in with us. Also, we want to welcome all of our online viewers. Uh, many of you might be traveling today, you're homesick, or you're just checking us out online for the first time. We're, we're glad that you're tuning in. We pray that God would speak to you this morning. And then we always, yes, always want to give honor to all of the brave military men and women. Come on, Amen. serving Come on. and protecting our country and freedoms. We love you, we honor you, and we have much respect for you. So, well, Pastor Ben, let's jump into today. Uh, we've, got, we've, got some, we've got some really great, great questions. And uh, before, before we tackle this first question, let me, let me ask by a round of applause or somebody shouting out loud, have you enjoyed this series so far? Come on. You know, I just think, I think the practical you know, kind of real, raw questions that have been submitted can really connect to the heart of people. Um, so many people have been brave, even though they've been anonymous questions, to submit them anyway with transparency and uh, to say, hey, here's a question that I've been asking. And then one of the things I've heard so often is, I'm glad somebody asked that because I wanted to ask that too. And so hopefully we've helped not only equip you and your journey as a believer, but also we've equipped you through God's word as you engage in conversations with coworkers, family members, you know, et cetera, friends and so on, as you have conversations about faith, about life, about Bible, about parenting or whatever that may look like. So, so let's jump into today yes, together because yes. we want to we get started. We got quite a few questions, so let's try and tackle as many as we can. What a privilege. So the first question that we have is, is cremation wrong in the eyes of God? How many have ever wondered this question before you've asked or heard this question asked, is cremation wrong in the eyes of God? All of our answers that we give with all of the questions that have been submitted, they are given more than just by my opinion alone. Um, because my opinion doesn't carry much, you know, credibility or authority. So we've gone to the book, the Bible. How many of you are thankful for this word, the word of God? Come on. Amen. So, Amen. so when we saw this question come in, you know, I wanted to go to scripture. And to be honest with you, I cannot find anything concrete in scripture that indicates this modern practice of cremation is either inappropriate or appropriate. You know, the Bible doesn't, the Bible doesn't say cremation is okay or do not cremate. Does that make sense? Yes. Um, what I do find in the Bible, though, uh, all throughout the scripture, is that this, this process of traditional burial, you know, is far more common than cremation. As a matter of fact, cremation was rare in scripture, but again, I can't find anything that says that cremation is right or cremation is wrong. Does that make sense? Yes. 100%. Now, what I do know is this, is that a lot of Christians have a problem with this idea of cremation. You know, they, they have, maybe it is a, 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 a certain theological belief they have or a particular conviction that they were raised up with. And then on the flip side of that coin, Many Christians have no problem with this idea of cremation or the process of cremation. They're comfortable, you know, with, with cremating the, the remains of their loved ones. And I think the reason that those individuals find peace in that decision is because they recognize that it is the spiritual body that yes. gains entrance into eternity, not the physical body. So when we, when we look at it from that perspective, I think that those that are okay with this process of cremation, then they can come to the conclusion, well, it's not the physical body that enters into eternity anyway. It's the spiritual, the spiritual body. So I, I would kind of base my response to this particular question like this. The decision on how to treat the remains of a loved one are guided more by, the first thought is this, the culture 
in which a person lives. The, the diversity of our church at both campuses is beautiful. Uh, we have people from all over the world. And so because of that, there are some cultures outside of the United States of America where cremation is the practice. And so based off of that culture, then maybe they make the decision that way to proceed with cremation. Another reason I think that someone may, you know, choose to walk through this uh, cremation uh, process is because of the financial burden. That's it's expensive. Cr- it's created, uh, you know, uh, pardon me, it's, it's expensive to have a funeral. You know, it creates a financial burden to bury someone. Many of you here in this room and online and at Go Church, you've had the unfortunate experience of having to bury someone that you love. And that financial burden is extremely heavy at times. And so cremation is just, it's, it's a less expensive approach. It doesn't mean you love the person any less. It just means that financially for the family, you know, it's more, it's more affordable. And then, and then I hear this, well, you, you can't cremate because there's coming a day when those who have died in Christ, they will be raised from the dead and they'll be given a new body. But I just want you to know that God is powerful enough to bring together whatever has been scattered. Yes. Does that make sense? Amen. God is powerful enough, you know, to bring together whatever has been scattered. So here's what I would say. No matter what, what or which burial practice you decide, you know, to proceed with, and again, this part is my opinion, the results will always be the same. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. So I hope that's helpful. Uh, I believe it is. This next, this next question, you know, is so so important, especially in this time in America. We just have so much unease. It's a great question. It says, "How do I handle and deal with racism in different settings?" Examples would be church or workplace or school. You know, this this one is tough. Yes. Um, and, and I'll tell you why, a couple reasons as to why I find this particular question being submitted to me has been challenging. And the first reason is this. I don't know, honestly, and I, I don't know what kind of response I'll get from this, but I don't know how much credibility I have in the bank with my Hispanic friends, my Asian friends, my African-American friends, and whoever else has been a victim of racism because I'm some white guy sitting up here on the platform. So for, for someone like me to talk on the topic of racism, I think I have one perspective of it, but the way that racism affects people uh, with the pain and the struggle of it, you know, I, I don't know how much credibility they're going to give me to answer this question and bring much clarity or validity. Now, in an effort to build some credibility, and I hope that I can, I, I will tell you all that I have been multiple times a victim of racism. And here's why. When I was growing up in middle school and high school, uh, the, the bus routes that were mapped out for us, it put uh, our subdivision where I lived, it put me in a part of town where I would attend school and the white students were the minority by far, by far. Uh, there were far more Hispanics and African Americans that attended my middle school and high school than there were white people. And so I can vividly remember, uh, painfully remember, uh, getting bullied, getting picked on, even getting beat up simply because of the color of my skin and because I didn't fit in with the majority of the people that attended that middle school and high school. As a matter of fact, there, there, were, there were many days that the law enforcement would have to show up to our school to protect all of the white students because of the violence that was being taken place towards us. So, so again, I know that that doesn't mean that I'm facing it every day, but I, I do know the pain of that to some degree. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. And, you know, living in that environment, growing up in my adolescence, it did teach me a lot about this topic of racism, but the thing that I learned most about was myself and who I was and how God created me to be. And you would think, at least in my opinion, you would think that, after all of these years, we would somehow have figured out how to treat each other by now. Amen. Yeah. You know, but we Come still on. wrestle with respecting people for who they are and whose they are as a child of God Come and on. not disrespecting them because of the pigmentation of their skin. 
Yes. We, we are not more valuable or less valuable because of the color of this outwardly flesh. Come on, somebody help me out for a yeah. moment. We find our value as sons and daughters, our identity in Christ Jesus, that we were all created in his image. Red, yellow, black, white, etc. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And what's sad is, I mean, the, the, the civil rights movement happened north of 50 years ago. Yep. And, and you would think that we would be at a place again where we could treat people with greater respect and greater value and greater dignity. But when trending conversations happen, conversations like Black Lives Matter, conversations like police brutality, conversations centered around the importance of racial reconciliation, which, by the way, those are needed conversations. 100%. We, we cannot run or hide from the issue of racism. But every time that we try to have those conversations, it seems like tension just flares up. That, that it's hard to, to press past the insecurity of those conversations without revealing more frustration and more pain. Does that make sense? Yeah, 100%. You know, and so I, I know that for many people in this room, and again, our family at Go Church, they're, they're dealing with racism, and they're dealing with racist people. Yes. And there's pain in that, and, and we see that to be absolutely in today's culture, but racism isn't just, hasn't just happened today alone. It's not like all of a sudden we're dealing with racism and this has never happened in our history before. All throughout history, we see that racism has been used as a plan and a scheme and a plot of the enemy to bring disunity among people and especially in the church. Yeah, and I'm, I'm glad that you say that because I think the one thing the devil's trying to hit in the church and, and really in our communities is is that unity because it's unity that scares the enemy. Come on. It's us being together, moving as one body for the kingdom, for the for the gospel, um, and, and that, that really scares him. And so any way he can creep in there and divide, uh, and I think you hit it right on the head, is he's trying to crack that unity that we're trying to build in, in God's house because we know if we can build the culture in here, then we can affect the culture out there. Come Amen. on. So talk, Let's talk on that for a minute because here's what, here's what society says today. And I'll let you address this for a moment. Society says that when we have conversations about like black lives matter and blue lives matter, that it has to be either or. It can't be both and. Yeah. And I think that that's one of the, the really the sad hangups in our culture is the moment you say that black lives matter, then that means blue lives don't matter and right. vice versa. And so what our culture has tricked our children into and really many of our adults via social media and through the news media is that you have to pick one and you have to pick the other and as soon as you pick one you're the enemy of the other but I believe that the Lord I believe that there's a third option you can love police recognize that there's a problem and you can love African-American black yeah. lives matter yeah all of these things I'm so sick of the enemy trying to tell us that as soon as we pick one we've got to abandon everyone else and throw everyone else to the side because that's not that's not the gospel at its heart that's yeah not the and and here, here's what we need more than anything, and, and, and time doesn't permit us to, to continue to peel off layers after layers with this conversation because this the church should be talking about this topic. Yes, I think the church probably, uh, well, not probably, I believe in the civil rights area, the church as a whole was too silent. Um, yeah. Especially white churches were too silent if we could just have an honest moment about what was going on in our nation. Uh, and if we're going to continue to really change this world, which we, we, know, we all know really desperately needs the Lord, more than anything, and I'm so excited to be here to help with outreach uh, and to really just see uh, this, this this county and this area change. Absolutely. Uh, if we want to see that change happen, it's got to really be evident in this house first. It does, and, I, and I, I'll say, you know, as a Caucasian, you know, uh, evangelical pastor, there, there is a fear of having these conversations at times because there's such hypersensitivity in our culture. Every, everybody is so easily offended. You know, and so I think, and I can't speak on behalf of everybody, but there have been times that I've wanted to address these certain topics, and then I feel as though, man, if I say anything, I'm going to be attacked, you know, because again, culture says you've got to pick a side when the Word of God says it's a kingdom mindset. Yes. 
that, and we have to have that kingdom perspective. I mean, you think about the Apostle Paul, because again, racism isn't just a thing of today. The Apostle Paul, one of the, the early churches, you know, one of the early churches, you know, leaders uh, in that first century AD, he was dealing with this topic of racism. You know, I mean, if you think about it, the primary division of that time in the church was between Jews and Gentiles. Yep. Jews and Gentiles. And so Jews had joined this movement of Christianity, and they were trying to force non-Jewish believers, Gentiles, into manipulating them to perform Jewish rituals. And so there was this tension between Jews and Gentiles. Well, Paul didn't run from it. Paul didn't hide from the topic of racism or division or disunity. As a matter of fact, he faced it head on. And he said in Romans 10, 12, he said, listen to me. And I almost, if I, if I could kind of hear the tone of the text, I would say he's frustrating. He says, look, there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. He says, the same Lord, Amen. the same Lord is Lord of all. And he will richly bless all who call on him. And I, I would submit today, if you take that into today's vernacular, there is no difference between black, white, Hispanic, Asian, Indian, etc., and so on. It is the same Lord, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the Lord of all, who richly blesses those who simply call on his name. You know, and, and man, the Bible goes on and on and on about this understanding of reconciliation and the need for it. God does not show favoritism. It's not the kind of God that he is. We are all baptized by one spirit. Does that make sense? Uh, it goes on and on and on. So I think it's important for us as a church not to be afraid of these conversations, uh, to tackle this, this understanding of racism and realize that there is hope through the local church. So let me give you practical things, and then we got to hurry. Now, the one, first thing I would say, because the question is, how do I handle it? So here's some practical stuff. Number one, you got to be proud of who you are. Amen. Be proud of who you are. Wherever you come from, whatever your story, whatever your background, whatever your ethnicity, Ephesians tells us that we are God's masterpiece. And God does not make mistakes. He's never made a mistake, and he did not make a mistake with you. So we have to be proud That's of good. who we are. The second thing I would say is this. Don't process the pain of racism alone. Amen. Because racism is painful. It is painful. And don't process that pain alone. It is why we overemphasize the need for groups. Groups, 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 groups. Your church family, your actual family. Because if you try, if you try to handle and deal with racism all by yourself, you, you, will, you will implode. But when you can get around people that can encourage you, uplift you, give you wise counsel, etc., it will help you. The third thing I'll say is this, is that you need to say something. Amen. If you're dealing with this uh, in the church, you need to tell a pastor. Amen. If you're dealing with this in the workplace, you need to tell your boss. If you're dealing with this in school, you need to tell a teacher or a principal. You need, you need to speak up is the point that I'm trying to make. Speak up. Uh, the next thing that I would suggest to you is you need to decide to have a conversation with the person that is saying racist things or ignore them. Now, here's what I mean, and there's a lot of layers here. But if you decide to have a conversation with a racist person, you better know going into that conversation that you will not win. You will not win. You can't, you can't, you can't win an argument with a racist person. Okay, so if you're going to have a conversation with them, just know going in that no matter what facts you bring, what points you have, what perspective you, you bring up, what biblical, you know, scripture you have. I mean, if somebody is racist, that they will feel like their way is, is right. And then you need to understand this, and this is why I mean by deciding to say something to that individual, ignore them. And we've said this for a while, but racism is not a skin problem. Racism is a sin problem. Amen. So we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness of this world. Uh, that short list is not submitted to offend anybody because that could go on and on and on and on about how to handle this. And there are much more qualified people to answer that particular question. The heart behind my response is to let you know that racism is not from God. It is not from God. It's not allowed in this church, at Go Church, or any other church. Come on. Amen. You know, and we need to have a kingdom mindset to get past our insecurities and our 
uh, you know, maybe our fears of not wanting to have these hard conversations. We have to have hard conversations about racial reconciliation or we're going to continue to be divided. Last thing and we'll move on. I, I mean this with every fiber in my being. You ought to thank God at Go Church and here at South Metro for attending a house of God, a church like this where all people are welcome. Amen. Amen. I think I'm not, I'm not encouraging you and I'm not inviting you to visit another church, okay, because it's your home church. You should be here. But don't take this for granted. Amen. The, the people sitting on your row at that movie theater at Go Church and the people sitting on your row right here in this auditorium, listen to me. This is not normal in mm -hmm. churches in our country. Uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., he said, the most divided hour in our country is the hour where churches are coming together for worship. Sunday, yep. It's Sunday. This is special where we can come together and worship Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. Don't take this for granted. This is special. It is very, very special. Amen, amen. Moving on, we've just got so many great questions. Thank you for those great responses. This one is great. Why does the Bible routinely depict God as manifesting himself in dramatic, unmistakable ways and performing obvious miracles even before the eyes of non-believers when no such thing is happening in our world today? You know, a, a question like this doesn't, does not frustrate me. You know, I mean, th these types of questions are, are asked frequently. Why do we see miracles, you know, happening in the Bible, you know, and we don't see them today? What troubles me more than anything about this question is the last line. The last line. Uh, maybe, maybe the camera can widen out because I want you to see this last line at both of our campuses here. The line was, when no such thing is happening in the world today. Again, respectfully, but has this individual jumped on a Delta flight to go to every country around the world to see what God is up to and what God is doing? Let me tell you, all around the world, yes. miracles, signs, yes. and Amen. wonders, that they, they are happening. And I, and I hear people say this so often. They say things like this. Well, if I saw a miracle, then I would believe. If I, if I saw a miracle with my own eyes, then I would believe. And I'm going to tell you, unless you believe, you will never see a miracle. Yep. And that's it's the way that faith. this works. And there is, and again, respectfully to the individual that submitted the question, yeah. and that's why it's anonymous, you know, and I believe that they really want to understand this, but there is this, there is this theology, there is this doctrine that's, that's floated around, and it's called cessationism. Cessationism. And it means this. That these individuals, cessationists, they believe that, that the spiritual gifts, such as speaking in tongues, prophecy, and healing, that all of those gifts ceased cessationism. That they stopped when the last apostle died. That when the last disciple of Jesus died, then so did the spiritual gifts, miracles, signs, wonders, the gift of tongues, all of that died. Let me preach to you for just a moment. We serve a great physician. Amen. Amen. Who is still in the healing business, by the way. And the God that we serve, he has not closed up shop. Come on, somebody. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is still in the miracle working business. And if one miracle has ever happened since the end of that apostolic age, then cessationism is untrue. 100%. We, we see miracles all the time. And I, I would suggest to you like this, and don't take what I'm about to say out of context. Instead of seeing nothing as a miracle, what if you saw everything as a miracle? Yeah. The fact that God woke you up this morning. Amen. Put you in your right mind. I wish I had about 300 people. Yeah. The fact that your marriage is still intact, that your children are still, come, come on. on somebody, come on. that your family has not fallen apart. God is still working and God is on the move. Come on somebody, say amen. Amen. Woo -hoo -hoo -hoo. 
Man. How are you going to give two preachers a microphone and tell them they got like 30 minutes? Ah. The bottom line, though, the bottom line is this. Like it or not, be frustrated or not, I'm going to tell you the truth. In our culture, in our country, we have a more political mindset than we do have a faith mindset. We, we do not live in the age of faith. And faith always precedes a miracle. All, all throughout Scripture, all, all throughout your testimony, faith always precedes a miracle. And Ben, you know this. You yes. know this for your own life, man. And I want you to take just a, a minute here. But God, God has, I'm telling you this, and when, when you get the opportunity to preach, I'll let you tell the full story. But God <laughs> literally, physically, supernaturally raised this guy up from the dead. So all throughout my life, I've struggled with a lot of different things, and we don't have enough time to go into it. But the Lord has supernaturally really intervened and healed me many times uh, in my life. I've struggled with a lot of health issues as a child uh, and even as a young man. Um, and, I, you know, I'm excited to, to share that. But I do want to share one little snippet. You know, I was, I was um, born into a fantastic family full of faith, full of power, believing in healing. Um, and I was a really active young man in high school, played a lot of sports. And one day, long story short, I began to develop um, some heart issues. I began to have heart attacks uh, at 16 years old. Um, couldn't figure out what it was for the longest time. Finally got diagnosed um, with a form of cardiomyopathy. Had had several surgeries um, to fix uh, my heart. In fact, one of them, they defibrillated me back to life in one particular instance. But it began to really start this process in my life of really true bitterness with the Lord of Lord. Why, you know, he had already healed me once. Why have you not healed me again? You know, I read these, uh, again, going back to this question, reading God do the supernatural in his word, but yet not experiencing it firsthand. Uh, and I remember clear as day, you know, just to wrap this up, I was interning at a church and we were at Winterfest. I know you know what that is. And, uh, Everyone had left the building. We were kind of corralled around these around 100 kids. And the Lord spoke so audibly clear to me in my life um, as I was standing on the steps of Thompson Bowling Arena. And he said, he said, how do you ever expect to lay hands and pray and believe I can heal these children if you don't even believe that I can heal you? And uh, in that moment, five men walked up to me. One of them was the pastor, and he said, the Lord literally just spoke to me clear in my ear and said, I need to pray for your heart right now. Hear me, we had prayed for my heart for years. I mean, seven, eight years, we prayed for my heart over and over again. My parents had laid before the Lord, but it only takes one moment of faith with the presence of God for him to change your life forever. And so instantly on the steps of Thompson Bowling Arena, healed, 100% healed, top to bottom. Thank you, the Lord. I was able to go back to playing sports. I could eat cheeseburgers again. We talked about that. I, could, I mean, I had such a strict diet. I could eat whatever I wanted. I could, and, and my wife and I were just dating. And I know that she had had that question of, what am I going to do when he actually had a heart attack with her? Uh, terrified her to death, but the Lord knew what I needed for my future, but he was waiting on me to accept that he still moves today, just like he did yesterday, and to, can I do it? he's going to move in this house tomorrow and for in the future, so. Come on, can you give the Lord a big round of applause? I want, I want you to see, uh, that is powerful, and I can't wait for you to hear the full testimony. Uh, Ben's resume wasn't impressive, but his testimony was, so we hired the Come guy. On. You know, when, when, when he tells you he's been raised from the dead like three times, you put that guy on staff. Come on, somebody, real quick, you know. Well, I want you to see something because this is, this is happening in our culture, and I want to speak specifically to those that are inside of the United States because these statistics would, would uh, reflect this society and culture. The average person in, in, in our country lives to be 77 years old, 77 years old. That's 28,000 days, 670,000 hours, or 40 million minutes. Think about that. However, the average person spends three hours every single day on the television. That's 90 hours a month, 45 days every year, or nine years of their lifetime watching TV. The average person spends 90 minutes every single day on their cell phone, either texting or talking. 45 hours a month, 23 days a year, or almost four years 
of their life. The average person spends one hour every single day in the bathroom. Some of you ladies are like, yeah, I know my husband's always in there. <laughs> 30 hours a month, 15 days a year, or three years in a lifetime. I say all of that to get to this. Yet the average Christian <laughs> spends less than 10 minutes every day with the God of this universe, their father, their creator, their truest friend, the giver of time. That's less than six hours a month, less than seven months in a year, and less than three days in their life. And we wonder why we don't see God move. Come on. And we wonder why we don't see miracles, signs, and wonders because our culture has us glued to the cell phone, to the TV, to social media. If you need a miracle in your life, get off of Facebook and get your face in his book and you will see God move. He will move. But we don't spend time seeking the one who provides the miracles. And, and every single one of us, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, then, then you are a miracle story. You are heading to hell in the grave. Like your life had a death sentence on it. You accepted Jesus Christ and instantly your life changed. What about that is not a miracle? How, do we, how, how is it that we've lost track of that salvation experience as Come such on. a celebration of God's miraculous ability to intervene in our own That's mistakes and our own lives? So That's great. You are all just miracles. So we've got one more really great question. I definitely don't want to miss it right here. Um, if I don't speak in tongues, am I doing something wrong? Also, do I need to speak in tongues in order to be saved? Fantastic question. Uh, and a actually, on the online you know, form, this question about speaking in tongues was submitted a few times in different kind of variations of the question. So I wanted to make sure that we addressed this topic of tongues. And before I give any answer, I want to tell you this. Uh, I, I try really hard to be organized and planned and, you know, systematic in our approach to helping people be equipped in this journey. As a matter of fact, uh, in the fall of every year, I take a few days and, and I, I, I pray and I fast for the upcoming calendar year. Lord, what are you speaking to our people? What are you speaking to our churches? You know, et cetera. And in the month of September, I had planned a series that about two weeks ago, the Lord said, no. And I told the Lord, I said, no, 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 it's go. And the Lord said, no. And I said, well, if I don't do that, then what, what am I going to speak on? And I heard the Lord say, I'll tell you when it's time. There was a supernatural experience that happened in my life on Friday night. Uh, and at a different time, I'll be incredible. excited to share what God did. Um, but in that moment... And reflecting on that, I heard the Lord say that in September, we need to do a series on the Holy Spirit. And so when we're done with, with Ask Away, we're going to kick off a, a series and we'll, we'll, we'll put things together for you. But because this conversation around the Holy Spirit, about the baptism of the Holy Ghost, about uh, the evidence of speaking in tongues, it, it is necessary. It's necessary to have. And as a charismatic Pentecostal, you know, believer... I want the, the people of God that at least make the decision to attend church either here or at Go Church to know not just what we believe, but why we believe what we believe. Amen. And, and so, so I wanna, I'm going to tell you, we're going to do a series on the Holy Spirit a few weeks long, and, and maybe we can dive into questions like this a little bit deeper, and I'll share with you some truths that the Lord has shared with me. Now, uh, the best preacher on this topic of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is Bishop Alan Matura. So probably what I'm going to do is just steal all of his old messages on it. So, you know, but we'll, we'll give it a shot. So here, here's why I love this question so much is because there's a lot of confusion around the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the gift of tongues, etc. cetera. Some, some Christians in some churches don't even believe that this gift even exists anymore. Again, we talked about, you know, uh, cessationism earlier. Uh, a lot of Pentecostal churches places heavy emphasis on tongues, 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 and yet there's Christians that don't even live out the fruits of the Spirit. Come on. But they can speak in tongues, but they don't operate in the fruits of the Spirit. You, you should give me a better amen than that, yeah. by the way. So they're, they're shouting on Sunday in the altar and then disrespecting their waiter or waitress at the restaurant because they're not demonstrating peace or patience. 
50 cent tip. Yeah. So let, let me answer this question. I'll answer both questions that are, you know, sandwiched together here, and then I'll kind of build the context around it. First of all, I don't know if you're doing something wrong. I don't, I don't know who you are. So if you're living a life of habitual sin and you've yet to receive the gift of tongues, then yeah, because you have to pursue righteousness and holiness. Right. Right. You know, so I, I, don't, I don't know. So I don't, I don't know if your heart is, you know, uh, pursuing God with, with everything that you have. I do know this, though. Now, I, I believe this, and we'll talk more about it in a moment. I do know this. If you desire to be filled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, with the evidence of speaking in tongues, that gift is available to you. That is available to you. But you, you have to live your life according, you know, uh, to the word of God and live your life above reproach. Again, you can't just live like however you want and be like, well, I don't know why, you know, God hasn't filled me with the Holy Spirit with, with the evidence of speaking in tongues. Secondly, and most important for me, is this, you do not have to speak in tongues in order to be saved. Mm. I, I don't know where that, you know, doctrine came into play, but I do know this, that is not the word of God. And I want you to see this. There is a difference between the gift of salvation and being filled with the Holy Spirit and being given the gift of tongues. You, you do not need to be speaking in tongues in order to be saved. However, and this is just me talking for a moment, if, if God has for me multiple gifts, why would I then reject the opportunity for more? Mm -hmm. so, so if God says to me, there is the gift of salvation, and guess what? Thanks be to God for salvation. Anybody thankful for salvation? Amen. Come on, both campuses, if you're saved... But guess what? Newsflash. Pardon the grammar, but you ain't dead yet. You are alive. And in order to live this life and to pursue the things of God, you need to possess a power that is far greater than your own power. It is a supernatural power. And I don't understand why people reject the desire to be baptized in the Holy Spirit with the gift of tongues and and, and whatnot. I, I, don't, I don't get that because I, I don't want to reject something that God has for me. I, I've shared this story before. I'll never forget the greatest Christmas I ever had in my entire life. Never forget it. I was eight years of age, and all I wanted for Christmas was a bicycle. How many of you remember that request in your childhood? I want a bike. I want a bike. I want a bike. Pastor Ben, I did everything in my power to get on the nice list, baby. I'm telling you, I made my bed, I cleaned my room, I did the dishes, because I knew that if I made my request known to my daddy, my daddy would give me a bicycle. Christmas came and, you know, like most children do, I got up early to run downstairs to look at the tree and all the gifts that were under there. And I saw, I saw so many wonderful gifts, some wrapped, some unwrapped, but but I was looking for something more than what was there. I wanted a bike. And I opened one gift after another gift, one gift after another gift. And uh, finally we came to the part where my dad said, this is the last gift. And that gift could fit in the palm of my hand. So I knew that ain't no bicycle. <laughs> I opened it up. And I remember as a kid trying to be thankful and telling my parents who worked so hard how much I appreciate them. And but I kind of uh, went off to my room and a few minutes later, I heard my mom call for breakfast and my sister came up and got me and I was crying, man, I, I was crying. You know, and like any older sibling would do, she was like, dry those tears, man, what's wrong with you? And I said, I wanted a bike, I wanted a bike. She said, come on downstairs. I walked downstairs and I'll never forget it. My dad was standing at the sliding glass door only a few years later, he died from a heart attack. And I saw, I saw those big old hands and that smile on his face, and I heard these words. He said, son, there's one more gift. I <laughs> felt in that moment just the love of my father and my mother. 
And he closed my eyes. He put his hand over my eyes and he opened. I could hear the sliding glass door open. He took me by the hand. <laughs> what I'd give to hold that hand one more time. <laughs> and he, he took me outside. And he moved his hand from my eyes and I opened up my eyes. And there in front of me was the prettiest blue go-kart. Come on. <laughs> I had ever seen in my, I didn't even know what a go-kart was, man. <laughs> and I said, what is this? And he kind of reared back his head, he bowed up his shoulders because he was proud. He worked hard for that. And he said, it's a go-kart. And I said, I didn't ask for a go-kart. I asked for a bicycle. And my dad got down on one knee and he looked me in the eye and he said, I know you did. And he said, I also know you told me every other boy in this neighborhood was getting a bicycle. He said, but JC, you're not like everybody else. Mm, come on. And he said, this will set you apart. Well, I, I, could, I could hear my mom. You remember the old Christmas story? He'll shoot his eye out. He'll shoot his <laughs> eye out. My dad showed me how to start that go-kart, and we lived on Feetsway Road in Dover, Florida, a long, windy dirt road. And I remember getting out on that dirt road, man, and I had that thing 90 to nothing, baby. The, the wind was blowing in my hair. You know, I mean, it, it just felt like freedom. I could taste the bugs coming into my lips. <laughs> And from a distance, I saw a pack of boys my age riding on their bicycles. And I'm telling you the true story. God is my witness. I don't know how it happened. All I know is that Jesus literally took the wheel. Because the closer those boys got to me and the closer I got to them, I slammed on my brakes. I turned that steering wheel and the dust flew up all on those boys. And I sat there like this. Sup. Let me, let me tell you what happened. I, I got to stand for this because I feel the Holy Spirit. Those boys, <laughs> they got off of their bicycles. They put down their kickstand. How cute is a kickstand? I was riding on unleaded gasoline, baby. And all of those boys, this is what they did. Wow. What is this? I've never seen anything like that. I said, it's a go-kart. <laughs> one, one boy, he walked around multiple times. He said, who gave that to you? My daddy gave it to me. And I, I tell that story to say this. So many Christians are content with riding the bicycle of faith Come on. Simply pedaling. You better preach. Going through the motions. And God says, that bike will get you to your final destination. Or you can have something with power. Oh, come on. You ought to help me better than you're helping me. You can have something with power. Let me tell you. That's why every time you get around other Christians that are not familiar with a charismatic Pentecostal church and what do they do wow what is this well where did you get that from my daddy gave it to me I'd wish you stand to your feet and give Jesus some praise what is it I, I've never seen anything like it before it's called the baptism of the Holy Spirit of the Holy Ghost you don't need the Holy Ghost to be saved. But I, I don't know how you can stay saved without the Holy Ghost. You can ride the bike, and I'll see you in heaven. Or you can get past the bad packaging that has been associated with the Holy Ghost and see that there is something available to every single one of us if we say, God, if you have more, if there's more... There's curtain number one, but there's also curtain number two. I want more. Amen. I need more. Come on. 
and some people say, well, well, I'll just follow Jesus. I'll value Jesus. Well, if you value Jesus, then you need to know that Jesus valued the gift of the Holy Spirit. And it's important to know that it's available. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, the gift of tongues is available. And let me tell you, Pastor Ben, church family, you know, I want to tell you, I am not ashamed. I'm not ashamed of being filled with the Holy Spirit that has helped me to pursue righteousness with wisdom, to give me the power to lay hands on the sick and watch them recover. That, that when I don't know how to pray or what to pray, that I know that the Holy Spirit is on the inside of me. Come on, church. So I would challenge you at both campuses, don't refuse the gift of tongues. Study the gift on your own terms. And lace it with this question. Am I content with this bicycle Christianity? Or is there something more that can give me power to face life and all of its problems? In Jesus' name, give the Lord the best praise you've got. Come on. I'll turn it over to David, our campus pastor. Amen. What a word. Man, my parents bought me a girl's bike, so that's... Now I really feel bad about it. But hey, you know, isn't God great? Isn't his presence great in this house today? Hey, at this time, we want to turn it over to David, our Go Campus pastor in Maryland. We love you, Go Church family. We love you to death. Uh, and let's just give the Lord one more clap of praise. Isn't he good? Amen. Come on, right where you stand. We've got just a few more minutes. Will you lift your hands to the heavens? Come on, all around this room. And maybe you're here today and you would say, I have a desire for more. I want more. I simply want more. I need more. I need more. Just cry out to Jesus for a moment. Maybe you need more to help you sustain the issues within your family or marriage. Maybe you need more because of the pain in your body and the physical challenge you're facing. Maybe you need more power because of the financial issues that you're up against. Maybe, you, maybe you're just hungry for more. You're desperate for more. I'm telling you, the gift of the Holy Spirit, the gift of tongues, it's available. Don't reject it. Don't run from it. Learn about it. Study about it. Go on a quest for something more. And I'm telling you, God will meet you there. Come on, Pastor Michael, will you sing with your team? Lead us in just a moment of worship. Come on, let's worship Jesus, and then we'll be dismissed. What a Savior. Isn't he wonderful? Sunday right here at South Metro Ministries. Have a great weekend in Jesus' name.